Good afternoon and welcome to the Wilson Center's panel discussion today, Political Parties in MENA, 10 years post the Arab uprisings. The uprisings in the Arab region that kicked off in 2010 shook MENA and shifted the dynamics of change in a region that was and continues to be largely ruled by authoritarian systems. The protests and mass movements that ensued from Tunis to Cairo to Baghdad and Beirut since 2010 have introduced new actors into the political process that became a force to be reckoned with across the region. And while much of the discussion 10 years or more than 10 years later has focused primarily on whether these uprisings succeeded or failed or whether they're still in progress, little has been said about the evolution of political parties in the region more than a decade after Barzizi set himself on fire in Tunis. So today's discussion that we're hosting here at the Middle East program um, that is part of our protests and mass movements initiative um, is really about zooming into the political parties, featuring um, our very own MEP fellow, Moreno Ottaway, who is an expert on the topic, um, but also has been um, writing about political parties across the Arab world since March of 2021. And joining Marina in discussion is Amr Hamzawi, who is the new director of the Carnegie Middle East program here in Washington, a former professor in Cairo, but also a former member of parliament in Egypt right after the January 25th revolution. So he did, he did not just research and analyze the democratization processes, um, but also experienced it. So thank you um, both Marina and Ahmed for joining us today. And thanks to all of you tuning in. A reminder to leave questions in the comments box, which is a new feature uh, as you watch uh, today's panel or tweet it to at Wilson Center MEP. So Marina, I'm gonna um, start with you. Um, you wrote that political parties are the missing link between the protest street movements that we've seen and most recently um, in uh, Algeria, Sudan uh, and um, Lebanon and lasting political reform in the Arab world. Um, so why have we seen little movement from this, um, from sort of the street to political party reform? And why are political parties the missing link? Uh, thank you, Marissa. Uh, let me start before I answer your question directly to say that I'm really delighted to have Amr here to participate in this discussion because the work that I have been doing on political parties in the Middle East really started many years ago in collaboration with Amr Hamzawi when we were struck by the the fact, this was even before the Arab uprisings, when we were struck by the difference between the Islamist parties that were very well organized and had constituencies and really worked a great deal to build up their constituencies and the secular parties that uh, seem to be floating in, uh, you know, somewhere in space, but really were not clearly linked to constituencies. They were by and large leaders without followers. Uh, the issue of political parties has become even more important now because at least in my opinion, it is not the only, but certainly a main reason why the uprisings have failed to bring uh, lasting political change in many Arab countries. They have brought a change. It's not that they have not had an impact. The Arab countries are different today from what they were before 2015, but certainly they have not, the uprising have not brought about different political systems. They have failed to routinize the political participation of the crowd. Yes, people, the, the public is much more um, mobilized than it was before 2011, but it's mobilized sporadically because it really has not found a way to have a permanent place in the political process. And I think the failure of political parties uh, is there. What we know about political parties is there are a lot of parties in the Arab world now, particularly uh, since uh, 
2011, a lot of countries have legalized political parties. And even some of the Gulf countries are beginning to introduce <clears throat> by hook or by crook some semblance of political parties. The problem is not that there are no parties. The problem is that there are too many parties. Uh, as I was working on the papers that we published, I was going through the, uh, you know, I'm at the point of looking at election results in various countries and counting how many parties were participating. And there were dozens of them. I mean, there is an absurd number, but if you have too many political parties, all of which, uh, some of which get no votes, no seats at all, <clears throat> most of which get maybe one, two seats at the most, you might as well not have any political parties because they really do not bring together the, uh, you know, they don't aggregate the interest of their constituencies. They end up by not, uh, by not uh, uh, representing anybody. And the reason why I think the parties are the missing link is that there, this mechanism for routinizing participation is absent. Uh, at this point, or at least it's extremely weak. Uh, just one more comment, and it is that is uh, when we when Amra and I first started writing about political parties, <clears throat> the uh, secular parties were dysfunctional, but the Islamist parties seem to be well organized to have constituencies. I have argued at times, and this is a paradox, that in many ways, some of the Islamist parties were Leninist political parties, not in terms of ideology, but in terms of the organizational structure. That's no longer true. A lot of the Islamist parties are also falling apart at this point. Let me stop there. Great, thanks, Marina. Um, Amr, I guess um, it would be low hanging fruit for me to ask you if uh, you agree with Marina's assessment, uh, but also sort of follow up, given your experience as a former member of parliament, you got to see what the landscape is like. Um, and you've been researching and studying this also over the years. Um, so did the Arab uprisings uh, produce a new dynamic in political parties as well, or is it very much a weakened system, um, as, as Marina um, has also uh, mentioned? All right. Thank you so much, Marissa. And it's, it's a pleasure to join you and join uh, Marina. Uh, always a pleasure to uh, discuss with Marina, and I truly enjoyed uh, our um, uh, previous writings on political parties in the region. Um, I mean, as a quick response to your question, I, I do agree with Marina's assessment. Let me let me add a couple of points, sort of um, uh, big picture points, which would take us back to 2011 and maybe walk us until until today. Well, first of all, um, uh, 2011 or the first wave, and the same goes for the second wave uh, of democratically spirited, inspired uprising um, in the region. Be it the first wave or the second wave of 2018-19, uh, if the first wave was 2011, Tunisia, Egypt, uh, Yemen, Bahrain, Syria, before, of course, um, the uprising was militarized uh, from all sides, uh, and Libya before, before the uprising was militarized as well, and if the second wave was 2018 and 2019 in countries which were not touched by the first wave, Algeria, Sudan, Lebanon, and Iraq, both waves were not driven by political parties. So the number one point I would like to make is, it was a testimony to how weak uh, political parties were in the region in 2011, that the dynamism on the ground was not driven by political parties, not by Islamist parties and not by secular parties. What we saw in 2010 and 2011 were primarily networks of young activists driven by what I would call single cause initiatives always pertaining to human rights or human rights violations. I mean, that was exactly uh, your reference to the Azizi in Tunisia. That was exactly what happened in Egypt in, um, uh, in January 2011. And in, in a place like Syria or Bahrain, uh, political parties were absent. Um, uh, Libya, political parties were absent. So what happened on the ground in the first wave, and the same analysis goes um, 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 uh, or is relevant for the second wave. In fact, the second wave, part of the dynamism, especially in a place like Lebanon, was directed against political parties. I mean, not only that it was not driven by political parties, but directed against 
sectarian um, uh, minded uh, acting political parties. So number one point is political parties have been weak uh, at the outset of the Arab uh, uprising and continue to be weak um, uh, 10 years um, after the outset of, of the Arab uprising. Second point is basically very briefly on the root causes. I believe we can we can categorize um, um, three major root causes for the weakness of political parties, and I would include Islamist and non-Islamist parties. Be to refer to them as liberal, secular, leftist, or what have you. Number one is that Arab governments have always made a priority of controlling formal political spaces and not allowing political parties to, to thrive. And whereas before 2011, most autocratic authoritarian governments in the region were keen on controlling former political spaces, they left some spaces elsewhere for um, uh, protest activities, spaces to which civil society actors, groups of young activists could tap into and create some dynamism, which we saw in different countries in the region all the way from 2005 and six up, up until 2011 and later on. So, so number one governments were governments were in charge of uh, organizing polities. They made an, an effort of pushing out uh, political parties and not letting political parties compete. And by controlling polities and not letting political parties compete, I would also include domesticated opposition movements, liberal as well as Islamists. I mean, Egypt was uh, um, uh, a case in point. I mean, Islamist political parties, uh, or they were not parties back then before 2011, but Islamist parliamentarians were as domesticated as liberal and leftist parliamentarians. That is root cause number one. The second root cause, and that pertains really to the second wave of the uprising, is the fact that Arab um, 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 uh, public spaces woke up in 2011 to see political parties, between 2011 and 2014, to see political parties not only not being able to drive the protest dynamism on the ground, but even failing to shape post-uprising um, uh, political constellations. They were not shaped by political parties. They were shaped by forces on the ground, governments, um, uh, security uh, institutions, military establishments, strong business communities. They shaped uh, regional actors, but political parties did not contribute much to shaping politics post uprising um, uh, momentum. And that led to uh, migration away from political parties in the second wave of the uprising, I mean, be it in Sudan, Algeria, or Lebanon and Iraq. The third and last root cause, and I will stop here, and that pertains to the two countries which where sectarianism plays a structuring role in politics, in Iraq and Lebanon, um, parties, legal political parties in Iraq, in Iraq after the American invasion of Iraq and Lebanon, um, they have been out there since the second half of the 20th century, have been well embedded in the sectarian fabric. Uh, of politics. And so they have um, manifested symptoms of what uh, protesting crowds were out there to, uh, to, to, to end or at least to, to bring an end to uh, corruption, um, uh, sectarian politics, uh, abuse of power, and so on and so forth. So it was to a great extent in Iraq and Lebanon, the protest dynamism was against existing political parties, including the uh, nominally rebellious political parties. So I'm referring to the Sadr movement in Iraq, for example. So, so far to the root causes of why political parties in the last 10 years have not been relevant for, for protest dynamism and have not shaped um, uh, politics on the ground. Let me stop here. Thanks, Ahmed. Um, and um, I guess one can also um, look at the first wave as a rejection of the entire political system, which political parties were a part of. So even though it was not particularly you know, in reaction to their um, ineffectiveness, but they were part of the problem as well. Um, so Marina, in terms of um, uh, the three points that I'm uh, laid out um, very eloquently uh, with regards to um, uh, the root causes in particular, um, do you see any changes from the movements themselves? Perhaps they're not the same people that they were in 2011. Um, attempting to enter the political field and being disenchanted and seeking new ways of organizing. Because one of the features that we discussed in previous panels about a lot of these movements is that they did not have any formal structures. Um, uh, 
First of all, I have one comment on what Amr has said. There is one point on which I disagree, that uh, uh, Arab uh, participants in these movements always attribute the weakness of political parties to the fact that governments were not allowing them to organize. I think that this is true in all countries that are not uh, democratic, that governments are trying to suppress political parties. There are countries where the political parties manage to organize nevertheless. So that I think it's a bit, I think one has to go a little further of why this, uh, this uh, uh, opposition, uh, members of the opposition, let's say, did not really do more to organize political parties, but leave that aside for a moment. I think there was a difference in the second wave of uprisings, and I totally agree with the two waves and so on, that participants in the second wave of uprisings, and particularly in the ones that went further, and there I mean Algeria and Sudan, that really had an impact on, on what was happening. We're very aware of the failure of their predecessors. They were very aware of the failure of uh, the, uh, uh, both the, the street movements and of the political parties and try to react uh, accordingly. The Algerian in particular did try did make a big effort. In addition to make an effort to make the, the protest, uh, what do you say, sustainable, you know, so that they organized, they were demonstrating once a week at the students and once a week at the general public, and so to, to supposedly to make it possible to continue indefinitely. And they continued for a very long time. But they also tried to organize better. The Algerians tried desperately to, well, let me start with the Sudanese, because the Sudanese were the most successful. They managed to put together an organized movement. Was it a party? Yeah, it was not quite a party, but it was certainly an organized movement. It went way beyond the, the spontaneous uh, uh, mass protest and so on. And they went very far in terms of negotiating with the government. So there was a lesson learned there, in my opinion. The Algerians tried to do the same to some extent, and they failed because they couldn't find any leaders. They couldn't find anybody that had, and they really, I, I, I was following the, what was happening fairly closely. They contacted a lot of people, none of whom dared to stick their neck out enough to, uh, you know, to do it. So I think there was an attempt, but in the second wave to put, uh, to put in, to act on the basis of the lection, lessons learned from the first one. Thanks, Marina. And, and Amr, um, because you've been following these um, mass movements and, and protests, particularly, you know, since the Arab uprisings, um, have you also seen some of these groups organize a little bit more formally? in the absence of political party, um, uh, not in the absence, but given the weakness of, of political parties, um, that perhaps this is just a matter of, it's just a matter of time before they organize to enter the political game in a different way. Right, so I, I, I mean, let me, let, me, let me start by sort of drawing our, our audience attention to the fact that political parties Post uprising, post democratic uprising moments, um, always have a difficult time finding um, uh, ways and strategies to adapt. I mean, that is not an Arab um, a particularity or a MENA region particularity. I mean, we did see it in Eastern European countries, and Marina knows it, of course, maybe some of your audience as well, as well as in Latin America and Asia and the Balkans, everywhere. I mean, I was teaching in the former uh, winter quarter at Stanford on political mobilizations and democratic breakthroughs. And one of the key challenges, political parties old and new, I mean, you always come to an uprising momentum with a set of existing political parties, be it domesticated, be it oppositional or less so, 
um, uh, co-opted or not so. Um, and then once the political opening happens, you always have some interest in uh, establishing, initiating new parties or party platforms. And so they always face a tough time adapting to a changing political environment, so a changing uh, politics. And that happened in the MENA region in the first and second wave. So I'm, 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 I'm not sort of um, um, minimizing the difficulties which uh, existing and new political parties face be it after 2011 or in the last couple of years in the four countries of the second wave. So then Algeria, Iraq, and, and Lebanon. Secondly, of course, I mean, we, uh, if you, in terms of going, I mean, because Marina's point is right, I mean, Johan, yeah, we do have case studies where in spite of the existence of authoritarian or semi-authoritarian governments, some political parties could organize and in, 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 in some cases at least. And, and here you have to offer a bit more. And so, I mean, one of the points which I have been working on is historical legacies, because in, in the region in general, with the one exception of Morocco, and to a lesser extent, Lebanon, but Lebanon, you, you have to bring in sectarianism into political parties, but Morocco is maybe the only one exception where we've been having in a European sense or in an American sense, uh, left of center, right of center and centrist parties for several decades. Otherwise, political parties, maybe loved in Egypt is an exception, but otherwise we do not have strong embedded historical legacies of political parties. So once you open up that Pandora's box of politics, uh, post uprising momentums, um, political parties try to capitalize on, on historical legacies which they do not find, try to reach out to constituencies where they have been deprived of outreach activities for a very long time due to authoritarian dynamics on the ground, try to fashion ideological statements, and then they run into polarization, which is very much what happened in Egypt after 2011 or what's happening today in Tunisia. And that, that, that is a set of additional root causes which we can refer to. Now, to your question, Marissa, um, and, and, and be it in the first wave or in the second wave, yes, I mean, there have been attempts to organize in, 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 in the shape of political parties, sometimes with a clear ideological statement, sometimes with a clear political orientation, pro-ruling establishment, or again, in the ruling establishment. We, we've seen that, but it's always come to be quite minor in terms of its significance for the two reasons that you have on the one hand, oh sorry, I mean, as in Algeria, for example, right now, I mean, it's, it is a ruling establishment which drives to a great extent um, uh, political choices and socioeconomic choices for the country. And um, in, in, in confrontation uh, are not political parties, no, in confrontation are primary networks of activists who attempted several times to organize, failed, and are trying to sustain their mobilization. In fact, they tend to see liberal, leftist or secular and Islamist political parties as domesticated. I mean, whoever participated in the last elections, last presidential elections in Algeria, for, from an uprising point of view, I mean, those are not credible actors. Those are not credible actors. He could not even agree or push forward a couple of adjustments to the constitutional and, and legal framework pertaining to the election. So, so we've seen some attempts, but they have, they have um, um, uh, stayed short of impacting political change. And you're left with an organized actor, which is the, the respective government and its very well organized networks of allies, including financial allies, social and economic allies, some, sometimes trade unions, professional associations, which are co-opted. And on the other hand, you have loose networks of, of activists. Yeah. And, and, and that is a picture which we have been seeing in the region in the last 10 years. So, uh, but yes, some attempts did take place but with a very low degree of success in terms of what Marina was referring to as routinizing political participation. And yeah. then you see it clearly. I mean, my last point, you see it clearly. I mean, when the fluctuation of political participation of Arab citizens in elections, for example, is a huge indicator of how lacking that routinization of political participation is. I mean, if you, if you feel there is an opening, you go and participate. If not, you stay away. I mean, look at that voter turnout in some countries in, in the last 10 years. Yeah, uh, that, that's a really good point in terms of uh, with every change, there's there's an adaptation uh, component uh, to um, entering the political sphere formally through political parties and the difficulties of that beyond just all the other challenges that you mentioned um, with the state and its apparatus and allies. Um, so Marina, I guess I, I wanna follow up on that to sort of zoom into uh, some of these, you know, uh, activist groups and loose networks that Ahmed referred to. 
um, that are still very much active. Um, many of them are probably regrouping and maybe learning from the second wave um, uh, and to see how to move forward to challenge other uh, grievances. And we will see um, more economic hardships putting more pressure on people, uh, given the impact of the pandemic um, and also the impact of the Russia, Russia's invasion on Ukraine and what that means for the region. Um, so what, what other choices do some of these activists and networks have in, term, in terms of um, expressing politically beyond just organizing protests and putting a little bit more pressure yet again for a particular change? Um, in the again, given the nature of how weak and weakened, continuously weakening um, political parties are. Yeah. Uh, before I take on that uh, issue, I'd like to make two points that uh, I have one comment and then one question for Amra directly related to what he was saying before. One is uh, the first one is a, more than a comment; is an anecdote which I think to me is very telling about the nature of the pol why so many political parties formed after the uprising. And this was in something that happened in Tunisia just after the, uh, not just after, but uh, probably must have been 2012, something like that, fairly shortly after the uprising. And I was talking to this uh, young activist who talked very eloquently about the problem of the political parties, how they had no constituency, how there were too many of them, that was a very body out for them, for himself and so on. And then towards the end of the conversation, he said that he was thinking of starting his own political party, which kind of surprised me in light of everything he had said so far. And why was he, uh, uh, talking about organizing his own political parties. And the answer was because it was the only way to enter politics. That if you did not have your own political parties, you had no chance of participating in the elections and so on and so forth. And what struck me, I mean, very much as the symbol or a manifestation of how these parties are conceived not as membership of organizations that come from the bottom up, but as organizations that come from the top down. In other words, he was not talking about <clears throat> organizing people into a political parties. He was talking about, you know, registering a political party from the top. And, uh, hoping, and that I think it's very typical of that mentality. My question to Amr is, you try to organize a political party. Uh, and, you know, can you comment on that experience? What the difficulty that you found in that? <coughs> of course, yes, it was a pleasure. So, um, um, let, me, let, me, um, uh, let me start by narrating, uh, uh, and taking you back, narrating what happened in, in 2011, between 2011 and, and 2013 in, in Egypt from a political party perspective. Um, back then, right after um, the resignation of uh, former President Mubarak, and maybe some, I mean, you too definitely remember, and some of the audience would remember, we had uh, ongoing uh, debates in Egypt about how to create a sustained momentum for political opening. And those debates went in many different directions, including a constitutional debate, amending the constitution, then drafting a new constitution, then drafting a new, um, uh, a second new constitution after 2013. Um, uh, debates went in the direction of how to um, uh, bring in citizens uh, to, to participate in politics, in political events, especially elections, in a more organized fashion, which was not the case in the 1950s in Egypt. And a third debate which tackled primary political parties and my preference, and here I will come to, to narrating the story, my preference, because I was really afraid of the creation of too many political parties, my preference initially was sort of, I had in mind um, um, uh, an analogy similar to what happened in Egypt in the second half of the 1970s when former President Sadat created a leftist platform, a right-wing platform and a centrist platform. 
And my 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 idea was that we should. I mean, I'm, I'm, I happen to be um, a strong uh, believer in uh, liberal democracy and in liberal values. And we had, we still have an existing uh, party with some legacy, El Web. And so in, in the initial um, uh, attempts, Marina, right after um, uh, February 11, 2011, my preference was to, for liberal uh, uh, groups to go to Al-Wab and to create, to refashion Al-Wab as an umbrella liberal party. And, and with it, um, a leftist party could have existed, a conservative party could have existed, but that failed. And it failed because of the dynamics of the years before where um, vested interests did not allow a new blood to come in. And then we went in too many different directions creating that fragmentation, which you referred to. So I was part of that fragmentation. And then I, so I took account in a set of writings after 2013, sort of referring to the strategic mistakes which we, which we made. And one of them was to fragment the political party landscape the way we did. But my initial drive was to, to, to go to El Wab because it, it would have brought in the factors which I was referring to, a historical legacy, a name recognition because of historical legacy, a clear liberal platform in spite of the different decades of authoritarian politics, and uh, um, uh, um, sort of a loose ideological narrative in which you can have um, um, different shades of liberal ideas uh, represented. But unfortunately it failed and then in the second step, we went into the fragmentation and that fragmentation became even worse because it polarized ideologically in 2012 and 2013, creating the dysfunctionality of the momentum of political um, uh, opening. So, so far to, to uh, what happened with regard to um, uh, the party I was part of initiating, it's a legal political party continues to operate, but of course operates in a margin which does not allow much for, for uh, political parties in Egypt, be it pro-government or political parties which try to stay away, uh, keep their distance, critical distance to the existing government. The second sort of more macro, macro point I would like to make is about political parties in general, is, and that is part of what you, Marina, and I worked on before 2011, sort of the difficulties in the Arab world to bridge the different divides on the ground for parties to create stable constituencies. I mean, we have a rural urban divide, political parties, I mean, and Marissa, you will know that. In most cases, Morocco is the one exception. In most cases are urban creations. The El Wab in Egypt, part of the attraction of El Wab is it's historically, it's been a rural um, uh, and urban party and the platform has been out there in the rural areas as well. But otherwise, and away from Morocco, you always have urban uh, creations. Political parties are urban centered and urban creations and do not have much um, to, to influence dynamics on the ground in rural areas. The second divide is the socioeconomic divide. Um, uh, political parties have been biased toward middle class, educated middle class citizens, historically speaking, even under semi authoritarian conditions, not only authoritarian conditions. And now, what you left out where sheer majorities, sheer um, uh, underprivileged majorities and vulnerable communities, which to an extent found in loose networks of activism, their representation, and in some cases found in sectarian groups, their representation or in Islamists, in, in uh, far right wing Islamist parties, their representation. But the bias of established political parties in favor of educated middle classes um, um, has been a, a key point. Finally, it's important to keep in mind that electoral systems in most Arab countries have discriminated against political parties. I mean, we continue to have in many Arab countries electoral systems which enable independents to run. I mean, I ran for parliament as an independent because my par the party I was part of initiating was not legalized back then before the election. So I ran as an independent. And, and in, in, in Egypt, traditionally speaking, most parliamentarians are independents, are, do not um, uh, represent political parties or are not voted in based on party platforms. So electoral systems play a huge role in structurally discriminating against political parties in the region as well. So that needs to be kept in mind. If we want yeah. to go back to your question, what choices do activists have? I think Amr gave, you know, I think he certainly helps uh, with the answer to that, because I think it seems to me that the only possible answer, and I'm not trying to say that it's easy or it's going to succeed, is to organize real people, not just the urban intelligentsia. 
to really do the on the ground of organize, organizing that has never been done in most of these countries because of this urban bias, because of this intellectual bias of political parties. I had, Amr was talking about the Waft party. I had an interesting conversation once uh, during, I can't remember which election was, I think it was the first election after Sisi came in, but it was a member of the WAFTA that I had been talking to regularly for a long time. And we were, and the WAFTA was not campaigning. They were not going out, you know, and holding meetings and campaigning actively. And he said, why? And I asked why? And he said, because if we go out and campaign, people will come and ask you what you're going to do for them. And my, my reaction was, well, they should. I mean, you, do, you do vote on the basis what you think a party can do to further your interest. I mean, not in the sense of paying you off to, to vote, but in terms of, you know, what is your platform? What are your ideas? And to him, this was anathema. And I think if the parties don't overcome, I think, this bias, that uh, and put their uh, the constituents first. I don't think there is much hope for the parties, and then we'll be we will be back. Sure, uprisings will continue. I mean, people are not going to sit on their hands and let uh, these authoritarian government what they uh, what they want to do. But it is been politic uh, sporadic outburst rather than a sustained movement for change. Thanks, Marina. Um, I'm mean, if I if I may follow up, given your experience, because you talked a lot about how you went in um, and what that context um, uh, looked like. But what was the experience in Parliament? Uh, what pressures were there for an independent member of Parliament? Uh, what was it like working with others? Was it where was there space to actually form uh, blocks and move legislation? Because that's that's sort of the first step is getting in. And then you have the rest of your uh, tenure in parliament, um, tr navigating all sorts of um, political obstacles and barriers set from within or from without sometimes. Right, I mean, it was, it was I mean, in my case, it was a short lived experience. I mean, we stayed for, for um, uh, less than a year uh, I was um, I was voted in as an independent um, uh, member of uh, of parliament in a parliament which uh, was controlled by a majority Islamist uh, parties, um, uh, conservative right wing parties, and far right wing parties, and there there was no uh, possibility to find a space to coordinate from a legislative perspective or from an oversight perspective. I mean, that's what parliaments are supposed to do, especially in a post uprising momentum. You have to push forward a clear legislative agenda to address people's needs. I mean, we tend to forget that Ar Arab citizens did not take out in the first and second wave or haven't been taking out to the street to, to demand only constitution and political change. I mean, there are real bread and butter issues on the ground have been on the ground and we were not addressed. They were not addressed from a legislative point of view. They were not addressed from an oversight point of view. It was a highly polarized, uh, I would say, toxic scene, which which didn't yield uh, much results. Um, I, I, it's it's probably probably, and I did that in writing, so I wouldn't go into the details of why the polarization took hold of Egyptian politics very quickly um, after um, the uprising of January twenty fifth, two thousand and eleven. But it's what happened uh, for reasons which are um, uh, homegrown in, in, in Egypt uh, with regard to the conflict between Islamists on the one hand, um, their tendency of Islamists to even try to capture far right wing um, uh, positions and not to moderate, not to seek national consensus and secular doubts about whether Islamists would um, stand for uh, freedom of expression and freedom of religion and so on and so forth. And those are very legitimate doubts. Um, I remember a joint piece which Marina Nathan Brown, our colleague uh, and myself wrote on the Islamist gray zones back in 2006 and 2007. And that continued to be, I mean, I saw it in action um, uh, to put it um, simply. So um, one, one additional um, uh, point in terms of my take on, on why it was difficult 
for political parties to, to organize in post uprising um, moments is, <clears throat> yeah, I'm sorry. So, um, it, and I, I'm, I, I, I believe so then might be the only exception, uh, but in every single Arab country in which um, uh, popular uprisings happen, very quickly after the respective uprising or the dynamism, the intense dynamism on the ground came to an end, a disenchantment uh, process was unfolding. This enchantment was politics, politicians, and political parties. And political parties were captured in that disenchantment train, in this enchantment campaign. Now, I mean, you guys are not delivering, and for obvious reasons, because I mean, they were social and economic needs and they would not advance. And so that this enchantment pushed away citizens from joining political parties very quickly after 2011 in Egypt. I went to Tunisia several times in the last year, and that's exactly it. I mean, you just need to pay attention to what everyone is saying, and no one believes that political parties will yield results. I mean, they can promise whatever they will not deliver. And the same happened in, 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 in places like Iraq and Lebanon due to the sectarian make uh, of political parties. So that this enchantment uh, uh, of Arab citizens, as far as politics, uh, or political dynamics are concerned, did impact political parties and drove citizens away. So where did they go? They went to a great extent to governments where, where the traditional appeal and promise of we can deliver uh, continues to live and continues to be relevant. And I believe if you look at a place like Egypt or Tunisia to an extent up until today, you cannot understand the popularity or the partial popularity of the respective incumbent um, uh, president or government away from that promise of we can deliver. Civilian uh, politicians, civilian political parties cannot, but we in the presidency or we in, in the government can deliver. And secondly, where did they go? They went to, they continue to be interested in dy dynamics on the ground, but in the fashion which Marina was referring to, for eruptions of popular anger or um, uh, moments of popular participation, again, in the background of human rights violations or uh, uh, deteriorating living conditions, but they are one off. I mean, to put it in a, in a, in a simple, they are one off. They do not create that routinization which Marina was referring to. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, Marina, going back to the series that you've written, because you've zoomed in, zoomed into so many different countries, and um, we've we've had a um, a bit of a discussion about Egypt, given um, Ahmed's experience. Um, Tunisia and Morocco were referenced as well. But in your opening remarks, you also talked about the Gulf countries or the Arab countries of the Gulf, the GCC, where even, even in those societies, there were some, there was some movement towards participatory um, assemblies. And um, uh, in one of our discussions um, a few months ago, one of our panelists who is based uh, in the GCC said that the dynamics are also slowly changing in GCC societies because there are more expectations from people. Um, and the people are understanding more and more that um, the government or the state is not the only entity that can provide. And so can you talk a little bit about um, the GCC aspect and what changes um, yeah. we have seen also perhaps in reaction to the Arab uprisings? Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not sure it's in reaction to the Arab uprising. I mean, what I see in the GCC is not so much driven from the bottom, but it's driven from the top. That is governments who have no attention of really uh, allowing real participation and real role for the population feel that they have to project a a facade of modernity. And a facade of modernity does involve some sort of political participation. So that you have to, uh, you find countries like uh, the UAE, countries like uh, um, Qatar, trying to bring the, the citizens in, in some fashion. Uh, <clears throat> a friend of mine, at, uh, an academic in, uh, UAE once joked that in the uh, in UAE had introduced elections, but it was the government was elected that the citizens who had the right to, to vote rather than being the citizen who have. So I think it's uh, this drive towards politics. 
allowing some form of participation and therefore some sort of organization, uh, some sort of political organization is really more a, uh, an image thing. That is, we are a modern country. See, we are allowing political participation. I don't see at this point much of a drive from the bottom in this country so far partly because they are countries that have been so successful in buying off this content. They may not succeed forever, but they have been very, uh, uh, very successful in that. Having deep pockets does help. And perhaps in addition, um, grassroots activism or civil society um, organizations are, are, are not really the name of the game in many of these um, countries as well. Um, but, um, what is your um, also assessment of uh, the GCC countries, you know, sort of joining in um, uh, and, and I guess setting up assemblies, um, uh, some appointed, others, you know, elected in, in various ways? Thank you, thank you, Marissa. So I'm not I'm not an expert on the GCC, so I cannot I cannot say much. I mean, I I I, I believe that Marina's remarks are uh, are accurate. Um, is it part of uh, creating um, a facade of uh, representation? Is it um, more than simply a facade and part of a state-driven, government-driven modernization uh, processes, which? Um, in some sectors of society are quite uh, quite relevant. I mean, I'm, I'm recently, um, uh, or I'm currently working on uh, the question of climate change vulnerability and what governments and civil society actors are doing in the region. And then you will be surprised, or probably not surprised, but you can take note of the fact that most um, uh, initiatives, projects uh, are driven by governments or by uh, groups within the respective government which are more interested in bringing in a um, modernized component of what states do, what governments do. That goes for green technologies, it goes for the creation of um, uh, tech industries with huge government incentives in the GCC countries primary and so on. So is it a facade? Is it part of uh, state-sponsored, state-controlled modernization push? Uh, which which has different facets and different um, uh, traits that that remains to be seen, uh, but I can I cannot say more than that. Let me draw your attention, and of course Marina knows it, to a big change which I failed to mention with regard to the political party landscape in the last ten years, which is basically the demise of ruling parties. I mean that is important to keep in mind. But one of the key structural changes which happened to the political party landscape in the Arab world or in the MENA region in the last 10 years has been the demise of ruling parties. We had two ruling parties in Tunisia and Egypt. We no longer have ruling parties. I mean, the current president, uh, Faiz Saeed in uh, Tunisia does not rule based on a strong incumbent party and President Sisi in Egypt does not rule based on a strong one, um, uh, one party control or one party system. That has been a creation or was a creation of the 1970s in, in a place like Egypt, in a place like Tunisia later in the 1980s, that the emergence of um, um, a one party led semi authoritarian setting. Those ruling parties no longer exist. And I do not see them emerging anywhere. Um, uh, in Algeria, the, the, the party closest to um, the president, Taboon, is not as relevant as it was back in the 1980s or even in the 1990s. So there is a big structural change from an incumbent or from a government perspective, which is the demise of ruling parties. They rule based on alliances or um, uh, the creation of uh, networks of support, uh, political, economic, and social in nature. And that is one, one additional reason for why we see so many independents um, in, 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 in Arab parliaments, because that one ruling party no longer exists. Thanks, Hamid. Um, there is something to be said also about um, perhaps the change of political culture since the Arab uprisings and how each with each sort of um, phase, there's there are new iterations of what that looks like. And so, um, <clears throat> we will wait and see what um, what more is in store. Um, and that brings me to the questions actually that we've been receiving because one of them um, that uh, is addressed to you um, is whether you believe we will continue to see more 
Arab uprisings um, uh, or protests and mass movements? Um, and if yes, why are we not to believe that elections will continue to, to bring um, Islamist movements back to power? Thank you so much for the question. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm inspired by the discussion to, to make um, a broad point with regard to protest uh, dynamism in, in, in the region. Once again, reminding everyone of the fact that um, uh, protesting is um, a normal feature in most polities, even in uh, semi-authoritarian polities. Um, and that has been the case in, in the region and with the current global changes um, after two years into the global pandemic and with the huge social and economic impact of the Russian war on Ukraine and uh, rising inflation rates, rising food prices, food insecurity emerging in different places, deteriorating living conditions. I do not see um, uh, protests um, as a, an odd feature of Arab social fabrics or Arab policies. They will continue to happen. They, and, and they were not a creation of 2011. Marina knows very well that protest activism existed before 2011 in Tunisia, in Egypt, and elsewhere in the region. So they will continue to be a feature of what we see in our social fabrics and in our policies. The question becomes twofold. One, how are governments addressing um, uh, protest dynamism? Are they out to um, uh, curtail, to control, to um, uh, criminalize, or do they engage? And you will not find, Marissa, you will not find a single government as authoritarian as they are. All, they all are. They always negotiate, sometimes depends on the space where the protest is happening. I mean, it's not that they always say, uh, let's arrest them. That's not the case, even in, 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 in recent years, even in a place like um, uh, Algeria, in a place like Sudan, in, in, in other places. It's, it's always a mixture of um, um, repression and sort of negotiating the tools. So the question becomes what governments are doing. And secondly, whether we have organized actors to champion the demands of those who are protesting, because you always have a set of demands, social, economic, and to a lesser extent, political in nature, especially with the ongoing disenchantment with politics and, and politicians. But there are some social and economic demands. Who can champion them is a question. Uh, professional associations, trade unions, loose networks, can political parties make a comeback? I'm not sure, but that is sort of, it's not about whether protests would disappear or are bound to stay. They are a normal feature of Arab social fabrics and, uh, and polities. Now, with regard to um, uh, Islamist movements, and that really goes to, as different as the Moroccan polity is from the Algerian, from the Tunisian, from the Egyptian and elsewhere, I believe Islamist parties have come into an existential crisis in all polities in which they participate. Their um, uh, duality of religion in politics and politics in religion has not yielded the result they expected. They created an environment which does not um, um, uh, receive well their uh, ideological statements once they moved into power. Egypt from 2012 to 2013, Tunisia and Nahda in recent years, Morocco uh, justice and development in, in recent years. And if I was referring to this enchantment with regard to political dynamics, I mean, this enchantment with the so-called Islamist politics has been highest due to the dualities of Islamist parties and their uh, very poor performance um, uh, in, in different ways. So they are in an existential crisis. They are in a second layer there's a second layer of that existential crisis, which is the fact that no one trusts, um, after 10 years, uh, no one trusts what Islamists used to say before about their capacity to coordinate cross ideologically, to embrace secular parties. What we saw on the ground was Islamists trying to hijack politics uh, for different reasons. Um, and that is um, uh, an existential crisis they are facing, whether it could lead to um, um, uh, renewal within those parties or not remains to be seen but because the, 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 the question addressed Islamist parties in specific, so I felt that yeah. they should address them too. Great, thank you very much. Um, Marina, um, a question to you. Is there a role for the international community to help political parties get organized and have greater impact? Or should developments be completely left homegrown? I don't think we know how to work help of political parties organize. I mean, the, the, the 
programs of assistance to political parties, NDI, IRI, you know, all these uh, the international NGOs that <clears throat> are involved in democracy promotion try. And they kind of, they have a kind of a mechanical approach to how you help political parties to organize. Uh, I don't think they really can do anything to change the nature of political parties. And I don't think many of us know how, the, you know, political parties in the Arab world should organize given the, the kind of conditions they, they, uh, uh, that they face. So that I think what's happening in the, uh, that those programs of uh, help to political parties, I don't think they do any harm necessarily, but I don't think they do much good either. And that goes back to your point earlier about their, I guess, inability to work with constituents or even engage them, which um, are at the heart of really organizing political party. Um, Thanks, Marina. Um, so and a question that came earlier on, I think, largely answered, but I will I will ask um, I will ask it of both of you, um, which goes back to sort of the, this, the initial discussion about political parties. So are political parties allowed by governments because they're often too weak, too numerous and ineffective or dysfunctional and therefore of no, no real threat to the government or status quo? Or is it just too early in the revolution to be critical of their lack of development? Marina, do you want to start? And then okay, I'll... let me start. After 10 years, I think you can start uh, reaching some conclusions. In other words, uh, it does not mean that there is not going to be more change in the future, that things are not going to continue to evolve. You know, history does not stop, but things continue to evolve. But I think after 10 years from the first uprising, we can say that they have not been very effective. I think it's not worthwhile, worth the effort for governments to, to try and stop a political parties completely. In fact, one thing that most of them are, uh, <coughs> seem to be learning, most governments seem to be learning, that the more parties there are, the better it is for the government because they cancel each other out and also, one thing that they are very good at, I mean, Morocco is a good example in manipulating the electoral system so that you make sure that no party can win the elections. There is no way for any party in Morocco to win an election. It's the way the votes are counted and the, the way the system is set up, it's not possible. So that from the point of view of the, uh, uh, the government, there is no harm in letting the parties play and give some, you know, relatively uh, help the facade of modernity, the facade of not being a totally authoritarian government without without any cost. Thanks, Marina. Amr. Thank you, Marina and Marissa. So um, may, may, maybe as um, uh, a reflection uh, to add to to what Marina has just said, I believe one question to be kept in mind for, for the years to come is whether we will see some governments pushing for the creation of uh, dominant political parties. I mean, let's not say ruling political parties, maybe ruling slash dominant political parties, whether we will see that renewed in some countries which have um, uh, historical legacies of uh, dominant political parties being um, uh, looked at as a tool of the respective incumbent president to control and, and, and his ruling establishment to control the respective policy. Would a ruling, a new ruling political party emerge in Tunisia? Um, would a ruling new dominant political party emerge in Egypt or in Algeria? That that remains to be seen. But that is a question for the next year. I I I, I believe it's important to draw a distinction between policies which are structured around uh, sectarianism and sectarian dynamics in Iraq and, and Lebanon, because there the fragmentation of political parties and um, the huge number of political parties most likely will continue to exist. And, 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 and the meager contribution of political parties to political dynamics overall 
or the fact that it's always mediated by a sectarianism as a structuring reality of the Iraqi polity and the Lebanese polity um, it is not is is not going to change anytime soon. And that really runs counter to 2018 and 19. I mean, those who took to the street to demand change demanded an end to sectarianism, a post-sectarian polity. Uh, with new political parties, and you remember some of the slogans which were chanted in Iraq and and, and Lebanon, so and and which were meant to 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 signal that it's against the ruling establishment with yeah. its ruling parties and opposition parties, um, uh, be it in 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 Lebanon or in in Iraq, so, and and between them and other countries in in the region, um, the Morocco, um, Algeria of today. Um, Egypt uh, to an extent where we have um, a big number of political parties, but their participation in politics is mediated through the structuring reality of the dominance of the monarchy in Morocco and the electoral system, which leads to what Marina was referring to, no party can win a majority, or in Algeria, the dominance of the ruling establishment and the centrality of the presidency, and the same in Egypt as well. I mean, it is the presidency, and to a lesser extent, the cabinet, so but the executive branch of government, which calls the shots, no one else. I mean, parliament is not an independent space mm -hmm. for political dynamics. So, so this distinction between the two groups um, needs to be kept in mind. And with regard to the GCC, it's a totally different story where we're sure. primarily seeing a state-driven modernization projects and not knowing what the assemblies are out there to serve. So early to judge. Thank you. Um, another question from the audience. Uh, does the panel see a continuation of political parties in MENA based on religion? This goes back to some of the points you just raised um, in terms of the sectarian parties in Lebanon and Iraq. Um, according to him, just reading the question, uh, these parties in Lebanon and Iraq have arguably driven the country into the terrible series of crises that they're now experiencing. Is there a way out of sectarianism as a basis for parties? In other parts um, of the region, it's also quite tribal people vote based on tribes i mean i'm born and raised in jordan and it's very much a, a tribal system in place in parliament as well so i guess i'll add that component to it is there a way to uh, a way out of sectarianism or tribalism as a basis for parties can i have a crack at it if the question is can something be done to actively actively prevent a sectarian parties from developing or ethnic parties from developing? The answer is no. And this is true not only in the Middle East, it's not only in the MENA region, look at Eastern Europe, look at the, you know, any part of the world that has, look at India, any part of the world that has plural societies, parties do organ tend to organize it along sectarian lines, because it's the simplest way for parties to, uh, to organize in many ways and to build a, a constituency. So I don't see the disappear. I totally agree with this, uh, with the person who asked the question, sentiment that these parties have had a very poor effect on the, you know, on the countries where they develop, but I don't see them disappearing, unfortunately. Yeah, if I if I if I may add, I mean the the uprisings um, um, themselves were in many different ways meant to transcend uh, existing limitations of um, MENA polities, be it the sectarian make uh, in Lebanon and Iraq, or the tribal um, element in in Jordan or sort of the semi-authoritarian setting with a leading dominant, domineering executive branch of government in Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and Egypt. But what, we, what we've been discovering is, in fact, how resilient um, those configurations have been. They are very resilient. I mean, the sectarian configuration in Lebanon is way more resilient than most um, uh, protesting uh, groups expected. Uh, in 2018 and 2019, and 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 the resilience of the Algerian um, uh, regime, the resilience of the Sudanese um, uh, ruling establishment, and and its its um, way of um, maneuvering around popular demands, and maybe Sudan is a place where uh, some of the popular demands were addressed for some time. But once again, I mean, again, the backdrop of regional changes in general, and um, that is backsliding too. But those configurations have been very resilient. And that is one of the lessons we have to, to, to agree on, I believe, after 2011 and 10 years into uh, the uprisings. 
can can they reform can they moderate uh, from within that's a big question once again following the literature on latin america and eastern europe and elsewhere that should not be sort of kept out of our consideration um, in in moments of economic and social crises global crises are there some incentives for them to moderate to reform um, uh, from within, uh, w w um, are there some incentives for them to engage opposition movements or non-sectarian movements in negotiations about new rules of the game? Um, th that remains to be seen. And finally, the big question which Marina's papers actually draw our attention to is sort of in terms of organizing on the ground, what can be done? I mean, how can you create a successful platform, be it a party or a sustained network of activism and routinized political participation via uh, which formats of, of, of political actors. Thank you, Amr. Um, the next question uh, we've, you know, sort of talked about um, uh, Islamist parties, but this is more specifically to, about the Muslim Brotherhood and especially in Egypt. Um, so do you believe that the Muslim Brotherhood squandered a once in a lifetime opportunity by not embracing a more multilateral approach in ruling Egypt, were you personally optimistic with the prospect of an um, Islamist rule in Egypt? This is more towards Amr, um, but I'd like both of you to um, to answer this. Um, and and I guess I would add a component: Does the Egyptian is the Egyptian experience with Islamist parties with the Islamist party? Um, how did it also affect other Islamist parties elsewhere in the region? Uh, Amr, do you want to go first? Sure. I mean, I mean, to your to your point, Marissa. Yes, it definitely um, impacted and influenced the experience of Islamist uh, or religious based parties elsewhere in, in, in the region. Maybe Tunisia in the first years after 2013 in Egypt, the uh, choices of the Nahda movement, um, in which it pushed for a consensus based constitutional. Uh, making process in which it pushed for um, uh, participation and, 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 and consensus building with secular groups for a few years was definitely influenced by what happened in Egypt and by the failure of Islamists, um, uh, of Egyptian Islamists. So yes, it has been impactful. Now to Egypt itself, was I hopeful? No, I was never hopeful because I saw that polarization unfolding from the very first moment. In fact, my, my hope for Egypt was for, for um, uh, secular parties to become sort of a center, a parallel center of gravity and to compete um, in pluralist politics. Uh, but what happened in Egypt between 2011 and 2013, 2014, I have to say, was a great deal of polarization, which Islamists were responsible for and drifting away uh, from previous centrist positions uh, as they were in opposition seats in parliament before 2011, the Muslim Brotherhood drifting away into far right wing, far conservative positions coming close to uh, radical Salafi groups and so on and so forth and basically um, creating um, uh, uh, or fast trying to fashion Egyptian politics to be centered around questions of identity. And, and, and sort of denying the right to right to exist for secular groups and secular parties. I mean, that um, led Egypt into a polarizing track, which was not possible to, to, um, uh, to get around. So I was not hopeful. I was hoping that other parties would be able to compete to impact uh, change, uh, but Islamists failed uh, to, to a great extent. And um, I believe it's quite, yeah, um, uh, unfortunate that they, uh, their dynamism was shaped um, uh, around polarization and ideological narratives and hijacking, controlling and domineering politics. There was not a big difference between what they were doing between 2011 and 2013 and what previous governments were doing in terms of controlling politics. Um, yeah, no, no, no. So, so, I mean, so far to my assessment. Uh, Marina, do you want to comment or I can follow just, up? Uh, I'll just add something very briefly. I would say, first of all, that the polarization, both sides are responsible for, for, for the polarization, not just the Muslim brothers. But the thing that struck me the most about the Muslim brothers, as it did about other Islamist political parties, is the incompetence 
you know, they really did not know what they were doing. And in many ways, it's not strange because they had always been removed from uh, from being in power, from government, but really they did not know what they were doing. I remember a conversation, probably Amr was there too, and this was before 2011. It was after the election of 2005 in, uh, uh, in Egypt, when a large group of Muslim brothers got elected to parliament. And I remember talking to one, actually, I think it was the leader of their parliamentary delegation that said, you know, you get into parliament and the first thing you discover is that you have to discuss banking laws and you have no idea about what banking laws are all about. I mean, they really did not know what they were doing in that sense. Thanks, Marina. That probably also applies to others who run for parliament. Oh, yeah. They're not ready for many of the committees that they're part of. Um, so another question, and I think this is the last question um, so that we also have time to wrap up. Um, also on Islamist parties, because you've uh, both talked about their decline. Um, so given that they're declining, will that support that they've had transition to other parties? Will other factions from larger cities, um, that from larger lists to win those supporters? Or are there alternatives also so weak that we cannot expect, um, that we can only expect low turnout in that regard? Um, do you wanna go first? Sure. I mean, it has to be. I mean, it's, a, it's a, an excellent question. It, it cannot be tackled, but in a case by case approach. So I, if I if I look at Egypt, for example, the support which Islamists had in 2011 and 2012, to a great extent was transferred to the incumbent government after 2013. Um, um, Islamists, um, uh, as I said, in Egypt, um, uh, polarized, um, uh, proved to be incompetent in the legislative branch of government as well as in the executive branch of government. And they were trying to attract um, the so-called stability voters um, after a moment of a political uprising. Uh, in Egypt, and since they failed, the support was transferred to the government. And since 2013, 2014, the incumbent government in Egypt has been able to keep that support um, uh, centered around it, around the presidency, and to a lesser ex extent, um, the um, uh, executive branch of government at large. Uh, in, in other cases, in, in Tunisia, it's important to see that is, this enchantment with, with Islamism, with Islam and politics, with Islamist politics, with Islamist parties, how it's unfolding on the ground and what it's it, it's leading. Is it leading to more support for liberal groups or secular groups or for more um, 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 sort of uh, um, escaping politics or um, um, leaving politics aside and not being interested in political dynamics? I believe it's anywhere in between. So we do not have a clear answer in Tunisia. In Algeria, for example, Islamists have never been beyond that margin of uh, participation that they have been having since several decades. And they accept that role of a domesticated opposition group and they do not appeal to more. In, in, in Morocco is an interesting case uh, because the, if you, in the last elections, I mean, you compare um, the um, uh, approval of voters for the party for justice and development in the last elections and the elections before, I mean, a huge loss a huge loss in terms of their um, uh, approval rates. Uh, did it transition to somewhere else? I'm not sure, um, but the voter turnout declined. So probably it resulted in voters not going to the ballot box or to uh, polling centers. Thank you, Marina. Yeah, I, uh, I agree with Amri. It's a question that has to be discussed country by country and situation by situation. I am not ready to totally write off the Islamist parties. Certainly they, they have lost their luster. They are not the, you know, the hope for the future the way they were. They have been able to organize and come back before. So are they going to remain a force of some sort? Possibly, but I really don't. Uh, uh, you know, you have to look at the different countries. Thank you. Um, so we have a, like about a minute and a half um, left, and I thought we'll sort of have a, a wrap up question and wrap, wrap up remarks from both of you. Um, and I guess what I will ask you to do is um, um, leave us with what we should be looking out for when looking at the political parties and that whole scene in, um, in the Arab world. Uh, there are elections coming up in um, Lebanon. Um, 
big question marks around that, um, as well as Tunisia at the end of the year. Um, so what um, do I mean, is there hope for political parties, I guess, is also is also sort of part of that question. Uh, Marina, do you want to start? Yeah, I don't think there is any hope in the next election cycle. I don't think we are going to see. I don't think there is any hope for real change in uh, in Lebanon as a result of this election. It's the same old people who are running for the same old position and try to, you know, form new alliances and so on. I mean, one of the most discouraging things in Lebanon is that after, you know, this wave of popular agitation, it's the same people who are, uh, the, you know, who, who are calling the shots. So, so I don't, I don't think we see. Uh, we are going to see much change in the next election cycle. What I would look for is whether we see any sign of more systematic organizing, you know, going beyond the sporadic uh, outburst of anger, essentially. And that is what is going to determine in the end what's going to happen. Very interesting point. Thank you. Amr? Yes, I mean, one last word on, on, on the very um, um, fact that Arab polities in general, MENA polities in, in, in general, have come to be um, uh, anachronistic when you compare them and their dynamics to social fabrics in general. I mean, you see modernizing social fabrics, you see modernizing economies, you see even governments um, 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 sort of pushing for modernization incentives elsewhere away from politics. Polities in general are anachronistic. They do not correspond to what young MENA populations, majorities are, are, are out and are aspiring for. And as long as that divide, that anachronism continues to exist, I believe political parties will continue to be less relevant in what we're looking at um, unless they transcend um, uh, sectarianism, they transcend the uh, long legacies of being domesticated, co-opted, or ideologically polarized and incorporate the spirit of the uprising and their social and economic demands, not only their political demands, they would continue to be less relevant. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Hamid. Um, we've um, come to the, the end of our uh, discussion. So thanks to both uh, Marina and Hamid for um, sharing your thoughts and your expertise on political parties in the Arab world uh, 10 years after the uprisings. Thanks to all of you for tuning in and for the great questions that we've received and um, on to more events in the next few weeks. Thank you.